There was a woman, a woman that I doted on, to whom I gave all my pent-up emotions. She visited me in my rooms at Cambridge, and we took tea near the canal looking over the water. And she said that she loved me. Then some money that was due to me went elsewhere, and she, well, she took me by the hand and placed me next to her in front of a mirror. There, she said. Holly, there. Can you not see the disparity? There am I, young, beautiful even, full of the joys of living. And there are you. Can you not see it? Can you not see it in the mirror? One could believe in Darwin's monkey theories if we all looked as you do. But how, Holly, did we ever get from you to me? You are ugly, Holly. Ugly. No, it can never be you and I. And my reflection, my ugly, ape-like reflection, looked back. There is some comfort when there is only the self to be disappointed by. Indeed, man is a self-reliant creature. And in this year of 1869, when Queen Victoria's dominions stretch to the new worlds and our kingdom is great and supreme, I, Ludwig Horatio Holly, I, Ludwig Holly, find myself alone once more. Oh, it's very late. Very. Vincent, what is the matter? It's almost midnight. Let me in, dear fellow, before I collapse. <coughs> Whatever is wrong? I haven't time to explain, Holly. I have just a few hours left. Few hours? Whatever do you mean? Shall I call a doctor? Holly, I am a doctor. No, a doctor cannot help me. I am past care. Have you been drinking? How long have we been friends? Two years, maybe more. Two years. How much do you know about me? I know you're a man of his word and a good friend. And you are solid, Holly. <coughs> uh, let me get you some water. No, no. Holly, I want you to look after my son. Your son? Yes, I know. I never told you. My son. I have a son. He's five. Five? Uh, uh, come on, old chap. Come on. Let's call a doctor. At least sit yourself down. It can't be as bad as you say. Uh, Holly, agree to look after my son. <coughs> well, me? <laughs> I will not be able to rest unless I know that you will take him. <coughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm so used to my own company. Uh, what use am I to a child? I have not I... been watching you for two years for nothing. <coughs> you must. I have maybe an hour, maybe less, before I... <coughs> oh, before you die? Well, all right, all right, Vincy, since I'm sure you're not about to die, I will say yes. Yes, I will take your five-year-old son. Holly, you're a true friend, and... <coughs> There's this. This casket. Uh, oh, will it leave marks? Uh, it contains... It is doubtful that you will believe me. When he is 25, you may open the casket. Tell me what's in it. When he is 25, you may open the casket and make up your own minds. Tell me. Vincy. But you won't believe me. All right. I am descended from an Egyptian priest of Isis called Callicrates. There, Holly. Your face. A very blank face. <clears throat> it's an academic's face, that's all. Go on. It's an unbeliever's face. <laughs> There are things that are beyond explanation. Things of faith still in the world. Callicrates was a priest of Greek descent. He broke his vows by falling in love with the last pharaoh's daughter, Amenartas. They fled Egypt together, and after many adventures found themselves wrecked off the coast of Africa. Here, they became guests of a savage tribe who had, as a ruler, an all-powerful white queen, a magician of terrible powers. She became angry with my ancestor, with Callicrates, and by some magical force struck him dead. But Amenartas escaped. She was with child, Callicrates' child, and she named him Tisisthenes, which means mighty avenger. She wanted, needed him to return and avenge their loss, to kill the White Queen. The contents of this casket proves my ancestry the route back to this ancient priest Callicrates and his wife, Amenartas. 
You still have a very blank expression, Holly. Well... It's in the chest. It's all there. Documents, family bloodlines, in the casket. Ten years ago, my father died, leaving me an inheritance, and I, too, tried to find this place. Tried to find this terrible white queen. But you're saying this happened thousands of years ago? <coughs> but that's absurd! You're trying to tell me that she still exists, ruling over a tribe somewhere in the middle of Africa? I mean, come, come, my friend, stay the night, sleep this thing off. You don't have to believe me. You of all men will decide for yourself. Anyway, my attempt to find her ended disastrously. On my way back, I found myself in Athens, and there I met my wife. As beautiful, I am quite certain, as that princess all those centuries before her. She died giving birth to my son. I have not seen the child since that day. I was unable to. And then I grew ill, and now I am sure to die. <laughs> there was something in the air, you know, Holly. In that hot, swamp-filled place in Africa. Something malevolent that carried disease in its breath. <laughs> Vincent. When he is 25, you must open the casket and decide what then must be done. I will provide for you both with ample money for you as his guardian and for him. He must learn Arabic and Greek. Holly, I know you won't be the most forward-thinking of guardians, uh, but you are solid, solid like a great oak. You will be the best father a son could have. I am told he is a good and bright child. Take him, take him and love him in the way I could not. There is no such thing as death, Holly. Only a change. Mm -hmm. You are wearing the most extraordinary expression, my dear friend. You will see. You will see. Where are you going? I would rather die alone like a rat. Uh, Vincy, stay here. Stay here tonight. I can make you quite comfortable. Uh, Vincy! I must go. Vincy! <laughs> Vincy! But he was dead. Dear fellow. Quite dead. My dear friend. My only friend. His funeral was attended by myself and one of his tutors, no one else to witness the passing of this good and virtuous man. Two days later, a letter arrived from his solicitors, announcing the forthcoming arrival of Leo. I cannot at the time say this pleased me, but I felt, of course, duty-bound to my dear friend. Though I couldn't understand why Vincy thought me so backward in my thinking. I've read all of Darwin, and only the other day I finished Herbert Spencer's The Principles of Biology and his riveting theory of the survival of the fittest. Goodness, one doubts if Vincy even read it. Poor Vincy. And so Leo, aged five and a half, arrived. And everything, every part of my ordered life, was changed forever. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 Leo, don't put it there. Uh, it'll leave marks. Um, what about there? Why don't we put your marble run over there? Yes, Uncle Holly. Yeah, that's it. Yes, that's it. Are you reading a good book? It concerns the finer points of medieval alabaster. Would you like me to read it to you? No, I only like trains. Ah. Woo woo! Job. Woo! Job! Yes, Mr. Ollie? Could you take Master Leo out for his afternoon walk? Certainly, Mr. Ollie. Can I take my marbles out for a walk too? Yes. No. Uh, well, just make sure he doesn't lose any. Come along, Master Leo. Uh, please stop making that noise. What are you doing, Leo? I'm only taking the blue ones. The others are tired. Golden slumbers kissed your eyes. Smiles away to when you rise. What are you doing? I'm singing them to sleep. Job does it. When he puts me to bed, he makes me sleep. He makes a marble sleep too. It helps send the lad off, Mr. Ollie. Mm. Golden slumbers kiss your eyes. Yeah, stop it. Smiles away to Stop when it! You... I, I, I mean, please, Leo. Uh, just go for a nice afternoon walk with Job. But they won't sleep. They will! Why don't I sing to them and you go off with Job? 
All right, Uncle Holly. Go on, then. Off you go. You have to sing first. They won't sleep otherwise. They might cry. <clears throat> Golden slumbers kiss your eyes. Smiles await you when you rise. Louder, Uncle Holly. Marbles are a bit deaf. Golden slumbers kiss your eyes. Sm Leo, are you laughing at me? Let's get that coat on, Master Leo. We'll be a couple of hours, Mr Ollie. Good. Years passed and we made a strange pair. He, handsome, tall, with a ring of golden curls round his head, just like his father, and me with my continuing great ugliness. There were many names for us two around the college. Firstly, Beauty and the Beast, and then as Leo turned 24 and the number of women declaring undying love for him doubled to two a week, the Greek god and his assistant, Charon. He became not only my son, but my friend and my only confidant. Then the day before his 25th birthday arrived and we collected the great casket from the deposit box at the bank. And in keeping with my dear friend Vince's wishes, waited until midnight before opening it. Lock the door, Job. I don't want anyone else seeing this. Indeed, Mr. Ollie. Indeed we don't. Hand me the key to the casket, Leo. There you are. I can't seem to open it. May I try? Oh. It's very stiff. I got some cooking oil. Yes. What for? It helps with locks, sir. Oils it. May I? Aye. Looks like wood filings. It's parchment, Jeb. Clearly of some antiquity. Are you sure it's not wood filings? Make good kindling. Is that for me? I believe it's your father's handwriting. Oh. My dear and only son, if you are reading, reading this, you have survived, survived to full, full manhood, manhood and, I and I am many years dead. Forgive me for never knowing you. Your life took away from me a woman, your mother, who was the light of day for me, the very air I breathed, and after her death I could not look upon you without thinking of her. Forgive me. And though I never stood with you as a child, I stand behind you now as you read this letter, reaching my hand out to you across the gulf of death. Holly, my good true friend, has, I am sure, told you something of the great history of your ancestors. This casket contains evidence of this history and of your ancient ancestress, the Egyptian Amenartas. Her strange story was told to me by my father on his deathbed. It concerns the love of a terrible white queen, whose dazzling beauty tempted our great ancestor Callicrates to desert his wife, Amenartas. It is said that she, this queen, offered Callicrates eternal life if he would abandon Amenartas. When he refused, this all-powerful woman struck him down and killed him, and it is said that she lives on, even now. This story haunted me, dug deep into me. It was as if a rope had been tied round my belly and was pulling me towards her, to Africa. In my mind, I thought I saw that terrible queen. I thought I saw her, her voice soft, soothing, eternal, echoing across space and time with longing, such longing. Her voice, Leo, was transfixing, as if the world could be held by the utterance of one word from her lips. I set sail, found the headland spoken of in the parchments in this casket, a headland near the river Zambezi, shaped like the head of a man. I walked for days inland and was told of an African tribe who spoke Arabic and were ruled by a white queen. Then I fell ill from some terrible disease festered in those swamps. I was forced to leave and my adventures took me to Greece, 
where I met your beautiful mother and fell in love, and then you were born. I fully intended to return to Africa, but my loss and the illness brought my life to an early close. Leo, it was as if the madness of the adventure and the land and the White Queen herself had poisoned me. Here is your heritage, and here is also your choice. To stay and never know, or to go and see if the legend is true. What do you say to this, Holly? That your father had clearly lost all reason and gone mad. And what do you say, Joe? I say you dig deeper under those wood filings, Master Leo. See whatever else is in there. Yeah. Uh, now this is in Latin. Caecilius Vindex, Atmilius Vindex, Atius Vindex, Roman names. A family tree. I ceased from my going, the gods being against me. This is Elizabethan. Found the headland, forced back by high winds, crew dead. They tried, over and over again. My ancestors, they tried to find her and they all failed. And this. Uh, careful, Leo, it could fall apart in your hands. Holly, it's ancient Greek. It's a beautiful thing, Master Leo. You translate it for us. I, I never had much call to learn Greek. Uh, I, I am an artist. Write this Write for my this son for in the last son. few days of my life in the great city of Athens. We fled, Callicrates and I, across the valley of the Nile, across the great desert and by sea down the Libyan coast. Callicrates, the beautiful and the strong, was a priest of Isis. He surrendered his vows for our love. My father, the pharaoh, Naktanebo, pursued us. We found an inlet and took our boat along its way. Behind was a marshland, a terrible, endless swamp. There was a headland on the coast that marked the inlet in the shape of a man's head. We thought we would be safe. We were guests of a queen, a powerful white queen ruling over a black tribe near the ancient city of Kor. She was kind at first, almost good. She loved Callicrates. She tempted him with her beauty and trickery. And when that failed, she guided us into a never-ending cavern with long winding paths that fell away into a bottomless abyss of darkness where the wind rushes and howls as if the walls of the place knew the dreadful defiance that lives within. The rolling flame of life a fire that seals eternity into a being. A fearful, dreadful roar. A light of blistering white. She stood in the flame and grew more beautiful still and became immortal. A being sealed by the flame. A being that would not see death. Callicrates would not look at her. He covered his eyes, shading them from her terrible beauty. I think he would have left my side if he had looked upon her then. A beauty that destroys all vows, all love, all happiness. In one mesmerizing gaze. Such did she look, naked in that flame. Callicrates still clung to me, and now, in her rage, she struck him with her skill and he fell dead. I could not defend him against her, and I saw the corruption she would become, and I cursed her as my Callicrates lay dead in my arms. I curse you. I curse you, Ayesha. You will never know peace or happiness. My descendants will pursue you, find you, hunt you down and kill you. You will grow weary, alone and desolate. And the ugly desperation of solitude will eat into every part of your being. Never doubt that my revenge 
as my hate will be eternal. She let me go. I have magic from my own people. She dare not harm me. I was taken to where the great river flows, and after much suffering found shelter in Athens amongst Callicrates' own people. I was with child, and to my son, the Avenger, I leave these words. Find her. Avenge me for the great wrong that terrible queen did to yours and mine, Tisisthenes, and to your son and your son's son. Across time, I call you to avenge this evil. Find her and kill her. What bosh? It's a mighty fearful story, Master Leo. Bosh. Look at all this, Holly. You can't dismiss all these documents. I must go. What? I have to. You don't? Across time. What was that, Master Leo? I must. Why must you go? Uh, to avenge some sort of 2,000-year-old feud between two ancient women. No. No, not to avenge. Isn't that what she wants you to do? Not to avenge. Then what? I have to go. Isn't that enough? Shall I put the muffins on for tea? No, it's not enough. I have to go. Why? I'll go and put them on, then. <laughs> I've always felt it. What? Ever since you told me what my father told you of the story, I felt... Watched. Watched? No, n not watched. I felt as if someone was calling to me. A voice like silk. Oh, that's just more utter bosh. And that's why I've never told you. And I suppose this calling is female? I'm going, Holly. With or without you. <sighs> There's much to shoot. In Africa, rhinos, crocodiles, giraffe, wildebeest, aardvarks, mongoose, zebras, cheetahs, kudu, leopards, warthogs, waterbuck. Lions? Yes, lions. Tea, anyone? We going, then? There won't be no muffins in Africa, you know. Nor upholstery, or soft furnishings, or anywhere nice to sit. So there it was. Leo's utter determination to go left Job and me with no choice. Three months later, we were at sea on a boat on course to Africa. I must say that I am a trifle afraid of water. Tie yourself on, Mr. Owen. Mr. Leo, here, take this boat. What was that, Job? Leo. You tie yourself Leo. on it or a wave will take you. What? The storm will pass, Mr. Ollie. What's that you say? It'll pass! What? Leo, take this and tie Mr. Ollie. Yes, sir. Don't look so frightened, Holly. What? Let's not speak to him, Leo. I think we're making it worse. Bail! Right, oh, Joe! Bail with everything you've got! She's sinking, Joe! Here, here's my note. Cut you, Mr. Ollie, free. We're gonna take the whale boat. Come on, she's sinking! Quick, or she'll take the whale boat too! Take my hand, Mr. Ollie. Who, me? Take it. Now, now jump. Jump. You have to push him off, Leo. Yeah. You pushed me. I must help these other men, Joe. This way. Get on the whale boat. This way. Come on, Leo. We'll, we'll all be lost. Leo. Leo. Jump, Leo. All tight, Mr. Ollie. I'm kind of loose now. Leo. Leo. I've got to help the other men. What's that roaring, Joe? They're above the storm! Breakers! Breakers, sir! We're near land! We're near land! Oh, it's not good, sir! Not in weather like this! Leo! Jump, Master Leo! Leo! Hold on tight, Mr. Ollie! Here comes another one! I can't see Leo! Leo! There's someone in the water, Mr. Ollie! You see it? There! There's Leo! Yes. Faintly, but yes. Leo. Leo, Leo. I can steer her now. Get clear of these rocks and wait till dawn. There's some blankets in the orbit, Ronnie, for, for Mr. Leo. Uh, 
You're a fine sailor, Joe. River Avon, Miss Raleigh. Fast tidal river. Sailed on her when I was a kid. We barely slept. Leo next to us, quietly breathing. And as the night passed, I could not help but ponder on this fragile veil of life to which we attach ourselves so fervently, this mortal coil. Eighteen of our fellow travellers were now dead, and the first rays of the bright African dawn, so vital and full of life, cut into the dark sky, but remained unseen by their dead souls, lying on the ocean bed. Holly. Holly. He's scary. Leo? Is it time for chapel? I only wish it was, Mr. Leo. What a racket. You hungry? Did I drown? You were brought back to us, Leo. Good to see you all, fella. We had a bit of a fright. I could eat a horse. There's some potted tongue in the box. Potted tongue, Leo? Potted tongue it is. Uh, <laughs> the eggs at home. Eggs, bacon and sweet tea. Holly! Holly, the head! The man's head! Goodness, Leo! There, behind you, that rock. It's in the shape of a man's head. It means it's all true. Uh, Leo, it really doesn't. You went round the back of it, it wouldn't look like a head. It looked more like a bump. Joe's right. It only looks like a head if looking at it from the water. If you look at it from land... But they did look at it from the water. Still doesn't prove anything. And that's a man-made wharf. Oh, come on, Leo. You can't tell me that's natural. Who would build a harbour here? It's stone, Holly. And what about that? Never. It's a stone ring for Maury. <laughs> He's got you there, Mr. Ollie. Uh, stop looking at me like that. It could be Phoenicians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, all of them passed through Africa. And it could be remnants from the ancient city of Kor. It could be Phoenician. You unbeliever. Which way, Master Leo? Up the inlet. That's where they went. I was afraid you'd say that. It looks mighty boggy up there. Listen to that sound. Isn't it amazing? It is, Leo. The sound of Africa. All that life. Ow! Oh, what is it, Joe? Splinter. Oh, I miss our soft furnishings. There was a light breeze at first, and we travelled gently upstream. Then the reeds and swamp moved in on the water and we were reduced to towing the boat in that terrible heat. I will not go into the detail of those long, hard days. Suffice to say that they remain amongst the most unpleasant I have yet endured, forming one monotonous memory of heavy labour, endless swamp, heat, misery and unrelenting mosquitoes. I can only attribute our survival to constant doses of quinine and purgatives. I, too, found myself thinking of soft furnishings. I have one particular armchair in my lodgings at Cambridge. I found myself thinking about that chair very much. Gif a la caramike. Gif a la caramike. I think they want us to get up. What are they saying? They're telling us to stand up, Joe. Well, I can't get up with five spears in the way. Stand up. We are many. You are few. Can you understand what they're saying? Stand up slowly. They're telling us to get up slowly. What are they talking in? Uh, it's Arabic, I think. You can understand them, then? Well, it's a strange accent. But yes, Job, yes, we can understand them. Shall we kill them, father? What are they saying now? Best be quiet, Job. What colour are they? They are very dirty. White. Yeah. They are a white colour under the dirt. Then do not kill them. She who must be obeyed wills it. Take them, but do not harm them. Put them in the litters and carry them. But they are so dirty, Father. She has ordered it. What are they saying? They're calling us dirty. Dirty? Move, fat one. How? He just poked me. Shh, Joe. They want us to climb into the litters. We were exhausted and had little choice and climbed, not with the greatest of ease, into the litters. The land was now grassland, a green basin that stretched out to a ridge of mountains far in the distance. The elder of them, and their apparent leader, approached my litter. He stroked his long beard and looked at me. You are ugly. Yes. You know our tongue? I do. Are you a monkey? 
The other does not look like a monkey. The other is most pleasing to look at. I am not a monkey. You look like a monkey. You have hair that comes out of your feet. I'm not a monkey. Very well, monkey. Uh, where are you taking us? To she who must be obeyed. Who? She who must be obeyed. Rest. It is a long journey. We must stay one night with my people. I must go and see the fat one. Job. The fat one. We continued till dusk, and by then, Bilali, for that was the old gentleman's name, was calling me Baboon. Come, Baboon, the pleasing one and the fat one. You must all wash. Why do you wear these bad-for-you garments? You mean my Norfolk jacket and flannel trousers? You are so dirty. Take them off. Uh, they're jolly good, these flannel trousers. What does he want us to do? He wants us to take our clothes off. There is a pool over there. Please, you smell so bad. I am very reluctant to wash with ladies looking on. They will not look at you, my baboon. They will look at the pleasing one. <laughs> Come on, it is like talking to babies. You cannot eat with us unless you are clean. It is not good for the food. And who will sit near you smelling so badly? They're recommending that we wash in the local pool. Oh, I'd love a wash and a shave. Where's the pool? Holly won't go. Their women will be able to see us. Oh, I brought up seven sisters. That won't bother me. There's a change of clothes for us in my Gladstone bag. I'm off for a swim. Where's Job going? To wash. Wahee! I'm going too. Follow them, my baboon. You are too ugly for any women to watch. Bilali was quite right. No woman looked at me or Job. But Leo was quite a different matter. A striking-looking woman that had been watching us since we arrived stared intently at him. Leo, much to my embarrassment, gazed back, and if I didn't know better, even encouraged her, showing his naked body off in the water and flexing his rather fine muscles. <laughs> Ustane, for that was her name, laughed. It was a gentle laugh, a very gentle, soft laugh. You could not help but like her. And when we got out of the pool and dressed, she followed him, blocking his path. <laughs> well, I never. She, she just kissed Leo. Did, did you see that, Miss Rolly? She yes. just went up to him, him and gave, gave him a scorcher right on the lips. Yes. Oh, goodness to Betsy. You are mine. You are mine. I have put my arms about you. I have touched your lips with my lips. You are mine. Across time. You are mine. How lovely. Leo. What? She's jolly lovely. You are hers now. Am I? The women choose. It is not the same where you come from. No, it is not. We find it much the best way. And when she grows bored of us, she will choose another. And we do not mind. They make the best choices. Men, they decide too rashly and not for the heart. Ustani has chosen the pleasing one for his heart. Not for his muscles. We should introduce this custom to Cambridge, Holly. <laughs> Ustane, is that your name? Yes. You are very beautiful, Ustane. You are also beautiful. You must eat. Come this way. What are your people called, Ustane? The Amahaga. We are the Amahaga. This way, you and your friends must be hungry. What's she saying, Leo? I think Ustane is taking us to eat, Job. Ustane guided us through a twisting path inside a cave. The cave widened into a great cavern where the men that had carried the litters stood in a long line holding their spears. Agara, their leader, looked at us unsmiling and with resentment. Hate, even. There we ate. What do you think it is, Mr. Ollie? <laughs> uh, some sort of local brew. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's boiled goat. Your hair is so soft. It's got the edge on potted tongue. Look your mouth. Your perfect Do they have mouth. to do that here, Mr. Ollie? It's put me right for me food. Where's she going? A big pot was brought into the room, large enough to fit a cow in. A cow or maybe something else. Ustani started to point at us. I wonder what they're going to cook in that great thing. Then all the men started pointing and the drums grew louder. 
What do savages eat as men coarse, do you suppose, Leo? Is Ustane a savage, Holly? Is boiled goat rather fine for savages? But then my heart turned over. The Amahaga started to build a great fire. I knew what was about to happen. I was certain. Ustani was now arguing with their stern-looking men. They were repeatedly pointing at Job, then at all of us. Then they put the huge pot on top of the fire and poured water in. There must be a big goat going in there. They're going to put a man in there. Don't be daft. With respect, Mr. Ollie. Men taste horrible, like lizards. Well, I've, I've heard they taste like lizards. If you like your cuisine, you're not going to eat a man. She's coming back. We'll ask her. Don't do that. Then she'll know we know. Know what? Look at her face. Look at the worry on her face. She's hiding something. Have you eaten enough? There's more to come. Is there? They moved towards us. The drums became louder still. Hatred. I was sure of it. Utter hatred. Why do they look at us like that, Ustani? Why do they look at us with such hate? Because you are white. And because you are white, they think you are like she. I have my gun, Job. Don't do anything rash, Mr. Ollie. Look at their faces. Look at them. They look harmless to me. Because we are white. Yes. And she has diminished all of us. Look. There's what they're cooking. Is it? Is it? Ollie! <coughs> it's a pig. Oh. You're not going to like that much, Mr. Ollie. I think you just killed a man. Two men! Man, man. The white man! Kill the white man! What have you done? Quick, we must get out of here. I can't see the way out. Ah, yeah. Let go! Let go! Mr. Yes, Ollie! Look after me, I don't! Ustani! Get off me, Ustani! They'll kill you! Let me wrap myself around you! Protect you! Ustani, please, let go! You needn't die too! They'll have to kill me first! Move, Ustani, or we'll run you both through! Cease! End this! She has ordered! She has said! No harm is to come to these men, and yet you defy her! Agara! Agara! Let them go! They killed Toman. There he is on the ground. They kill like she. They do not touch him, man. They do not kill with honor. They stand away and point like she, like the barbarian that controls us, ruins us. These white men bring the same evil. Agara, be careful with your mouth. She hears everything. They are the same. There is no peace with these white-fleshed kings. They take everything. She will know what they have done. She will decide. And you, Agara, you will come with me, so she who must be obeyed can know all. You would have killed them. She must know that too. There's no sorry in their eyes. Look, the white ones are empty of goodness. That's enough, Agara. And what are you, old man? What are you, Bilali? The servant of a tyrant, the servant of evil. Toman is dead, and you look on as if in serving her you have become as empty as she. I will come with you. I would gladly tell she all these things. We must leave. I must take you to she now. Come, come. Yeah, come, come. Come with me. And we were traveling again. Ustani came with us. She would not be parted from Leo. And Agara walked next to us, furious and silent. The light began to fail, and we rested, staying close to the fire, not for its heat, for we were quite sticky enough in the sweltering temperature, but the smoke was the only thing that deterred the mosquitoes, or musketeers, as Job called them. Ustani, tell me about she who must be obeyed. I know little. Have you seen her? No. But they say she's very beautiful. They say she shines like the sun itself, like a light you are drawn to, but that will burn you. Does she have a husband? No. Is she wise? My grandmother had a sister. She was nine. Uban was her name. She was always naughty, my grandmother said, always running and playing jokes. <laughs> she, she stole some fruit from the walled garden of she. Uban was caught. And she struck her down without touching her. 
and a white line spread across Uban's black hair. She withered, died slowly over seven days. She looked like a little old woman by the time life left her. That's what my grandmother told me. Just for a handful of cherries. How could she have killed your grandmother's sister? How can the same woman still be ruined? Don't ask me any more. She hears everything. She can hear the wind 20,000 steps away. She can hear a bird on the other side of the mountain. She can hear a death anywhere amongst our people. <sighs> she will be listening now, watching over us. I have waited and waited for my love to come beyond. I have waited and waited for my lover's song. I have looked into time and seen you standing, standing. You will leave me. You will prefer her to me. Ustani, whatever are you talking about? I see it. I see it. What can you see? But tonight, we are together. Of course. Tonight is our own. In the grave, there's no love, no warmth, no touching. In the grave, there's nothing at all. Vistani, there'll be no grave. Come, come, let me hold you. I attempted to sleep. But the wretched stink of the swamp, the bullfrogs, Ustani's stories of she and Job's snoring kept me quite awake. I looked over towards Leo and noticed that his face seemed flushed in the firelight and Ustani was watching over him anxiously. I gave him the last of the quinine and lay back and looked towards the heavens. Above me was the great fiery firmament, a great blanket of endless stars. If she is eternal like the heavens above, then what type of society had she created around her? If her superiority and her knowledge is so great, why rule through fear? And as I lay on the ground that night, I felt the shudder of my own mortality run right through me and penetrate me with a terrible female laugh. I felt certain that something truly fearful was about to befall us. Ah, ponder not the great infinite, ye tiny mortals, for what dread the imagination can summon. Ah, you're snoring, Job. Mm. Sorry, Lucy. Holly. Miss Holly. What is it, Ustani? The fever, Mr. Holly. He has the fever. Leo? Can you hear me, Leo? You'll never take me alive. Get off me. Uh, Job, uh, have we any more quinine? Oh, Job? Oh, I think I'm gonna die. The fat one has it too. Oh, they must rest. No, baboon. It is the fever from the swamp. We must move as soon as it is light. If they stay here, they will both die. We are an hour from the plains of Kor. Then we will reach good air. In the morning, Leo could barely speak. Bilali assured me that Job's fatness would see him through the worst of it, but he could not reassure me as regards Leo. Ustani attended Leo with unfaltering devotion, and soon the swampland was behind us and the grass plains of Kor spread out before us, encircled by a wall of rock shadowing the land. Bilali explained to me as we moved closer to it that the path through was secret. They blindfolded us and guided us through a gateway. What do you make of that, Job? <laughs> it was a vast garden in a shallow basin surrounded by an ancient wall and caves with apartments cut into the rock above. 
There were rose trees, freesias and wisteria winding itself around the walls and moving up towards the caves. The whole place was awash with colour. There were pens holding goats, ducks and geese. And a fountain bubbled at its centre. It's unnatural. What's unnatural? Rose trees in Africa. Leo, Mr Holly. He's worse. What's she saying? He's worse, Joe. The pleasing one will get no better. What does that mean? Ask Bilali to ask she. She can save him. She can stop death. Ask Bilali. Ask him. Is that true? She has not asked to see you yet. But surely we can ask to see her. No, my baboon. But Bilali, you must ask her. What if he dies? She will think nothing of it. At least ask. I will come with you. No, you cannot. Bilali, I will come with you. Surely she won't leave a man to die. Bilali! She has not asked to see you. I cannot let Leo die. Do you understand? I understand, but she will not. Rastani! You must beg, Mr. Holly. Go on your hands and knees and beg her. Beg? Come then. But she will not like it. Where are you going, Mr. Holly? Bilali is going to ask their queen if she will help. Well, tell her Leo's dying. That should do it. They're not sure if it will. Well, what sort of person is she then? Bilali and I entered the caves. Lanterns lit our way. In the dim light, I could make out reliefs that covered each wall, ancient depictions of war, of birth, of marriages, of love and burials. These are places for the dead. Indeed, baboon. Holly. Yes, my baboon. And the dead are still here? They are. An ancient people, the people of Kor. Their remains, as they were when they lived, are in many of these rooms. Men and women as perfect as the day they died. <laughs> these people held secrets that have been lost and we do not possess. <sighs> Suddenly, Bilale dropped to his knees. A more graceless image cannot be imagined. This elderly man crawling along the ground with his robes trailing along the floor. Get, get down, baboon. Why are you on all fours? Get down. I'll ruin my Norfolk jacket. She, get down. You must get down, baboon. I remained upright, but now followed a few steps behind Bilali. His progress was so slow, I was tempted to kick him. You must go on the ground in the presence of she who must be obeyed. Baboon. Bilali continued hectoring me as we went into a smaller alcove and then out into a place draped in hangings with ivory figures set in the walls. And then this elderly man threw himself prostrate on the floor. I simply couldn't do that. I didn't see her shape at first. I felt her eyes. And with them the same sensation that I had had the night before of mortality walking right through me. A sudden, dreadful, blistering coldness. A shadow moved behind a drape at the back of the room. You're afraid. She spoke. Or to this day, I'm not certain if I did not hear her in my mind first. Never be afraid of me. I will not harm you. Holly. Holly. I was shaking. I was shaking. I could barely speak. Holly. And she stood up and walked towards a small pool in the corner of the room. She was covered head to toe in tightly bound white gauze so you could not see her face. And she glided across the room with utter loveliness as if she walked on air like a spirit. Please try not to be afraid of me. You know my name? I have watched you. Oh! I will show you. Old man? Yes, my she. Your men, they would have killed this man and the others? Yes, she. If I had not stopped them. Bring them where we eat tonight. There I will judge them. Get up. <sighs> Leave us. 
This pool. There is your answer. I have watched your journey. Think in your mind of where you would like to be, and as you think, it will appear. And I looked into the water and imagined Cambridge. And there it was, still intact, still the same, miles and miles away from where I stood then, green and untroubled. Magic. Has so little changed that men still think that magic exists? Come, sit with me. Oh. Holly, sit with me. I have told you I will not harm you. How can I learn anything of you if you remain so afraid? <sighs> Tell me, do the pharaohs still guard Egypt? The pharaohs? And the Jews? Did their Messiah come? And Greece? I know nothing of what has happened in the world. Is Greece still great? Do great men still gather there? No. Are none of these things as they were? Pity. Do men still war and fight and battle? Yes, of course they do. No time can change that. No, that has not changed. You speak my language well. Where are you from, Holly? Tell me. Great Britain. And is she great? We have dominions all over the world. Ah, a powerful empire. Yes, the empire. And how did your people gain this great empire, Holly? We have superior force, superior knowledge. So, this was done through might and fear. Uh, we have brought civilization to where we have gone. As did the Egyptians, as did the Greeks. But they all ruled through fear. Your country is different? Absolutely. Hmm. Perhaps. Oh. It is so long since I have found another to talk to. Belali and his people come to me begging and on all fours. I weary of their worship and their simple terror. But your mind has a, a new universe in it. I have been here alone for so long, waiting. We will talk and talk again. It is so long since I have met a mind as yours. Filled. Can you see into my mind? You know I can. <laughs> but you have an ill-advised wish. That is a disappointment, with a mind so full of wonder and intelligent things. A wish like so many wishes that will do you harm. Ask. There is a man in our party. He caught the fever traveling here. He will die. I will come tomorrow. But he will die. It is better that he fights it. My skill will shake the very core of him. But what if he dies? Is he your son? As dear to me as a son? He is my ward. Tomorrow. I, uh, tomorrow. Yes. My she. Aisha. Call me Aisha. It is a name I am fond of and have not heard for many years. But that isn't the wish you wanted to ask. No. No. May I see you? I am covered so that you may not see me. You will waste away if I remove my veil. I will burn into your being. I will settle on your mind's eye and never leave it. 
and my image will be with you always, and you will love me for the rest of your days. I am past such emotions. I c can't love. I am immune to longings. Utterly immune. Then you may gaze at your own cost. And she, she who must be obeyed, Aisha, stepped out from behind her veil. And I looked. I looked upon her. In the first part of She by Ryder Haggard, Aisha was played by Mia Soteriu, Holly by Tim McInerney, Leo by Oliver Chris, and Job by Howard Coggins. Janice Aqua was Amanatas and Ustani, Ben on Wukwe was Bilali, and Damien Lynch was Agara. Vinci was played by Tom Sherman, and young Leo by Oliver Bainham. Specially composed music was by Elizabeth Purnell. She was dramatised for radio by Hattie Naylor and directed in Bristol by Sarah Davis. And you can hear the concluding part of She right here at the same time next week. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for on the Dimension tonight. But I've kept the seat very warm, almost too warm to be honest, for my fellow Dimensioneer, Toby Hado. What has happened to me? I'm lying on the floor and everything around me is dark. I can hear a voice whispering to me. I think it is the most beautiful voice I have ever heard, like silk touching me. Holly. It is saying, Holly. Holly. And Aisha's covered form is standing over me. Holly, you fell. I fell? I should not have shown you my face. Your face. Take him to his chambers. And then I remember her face. And it burns into me. I feel that I am drowning. Lying on the floor half dead from looking upon <laughs> her. And her terrible beauty. <laughs> and she is laughing. She is laughing at me. As I am carried out of her room. You all right, Mr. Ollie? You look like you've seen a ghost. How is he? Worse, I should say. Worse. Oh, Ustani does her best. He's a terrible colour. Is that she going to help or not? Tomorrow. Tomorrow will be too late, in my opinion, for Master Leo, Mr. Ollie. He looks awful ill. You sure you're all right? Mm. Sit down, Mr. Ollie. Go on, sit. I'm, I'm just tidying your clothes. I'm not like I can get them clean in here. There's so much dust. You pining for something? Can I get his water? That woman did something to you. What's she done? Nothing. Or wizen thing, was she? No. No? She's got you, hasn't she? She got you good and proper. What are you talking about, Joe? Well, I never. That's she. You look like a babbling youngster, Mr. Ollie. No offence, men, Mr. Ollie. I... I just never a thought. Thought you was immune to women. She's not a woman. That makes it no better, Mr. Ollie, sir. She's a goddess. Oh, dear. My baboon. Pirali. You and the fat one are to come with me to the feast. You, my baboon, are to sit with she. Tonight is the judgment on those that hurt you. I brought you a robe to cover your jacket. A robe? Is that for you? Blimey. Purple and pink. Suit your colouring, Mr. Ollie. I have no intention of wearing a robe, Bilali. 
Oh, my baboon, you dress so badly. Aisha was covered as before. I ached to see her face again. Then she beckoned to me with a graceful white hand. I sat next to her and breathed in her scent and watched each lovely movement of her slender neck as she talked. You're sitting next to her? Well, where shall I sit then? There. At your feet? There then. Oh, all right. Bring them in. And the men that had assaulted us were brought in, shivering and tied together like cattle. Did you attack this man and the other white people? Yes, we did. Bilali, my servant and father of your household, forbade you harm these men. They killed Toman. They killed my brother. You defied my order. They killed Toman. You defied my order. Have you learnt nothing? Have not your father and your father's father told you that you cannot disobey me? And if you do, the punishment for your defiance is death. They killed Toman. I am not frightened of you, White Queen. These people are like you. They murder senselessly, and yet you choose to punish me and my brothers, not the killers by your side. My instructions were that no harm should come to the white men. He was my brother. We have been your slaves for centuries. You have beaten us, killed us, and crushed us till there is no right and wrong in our lives. Nothing that is ours. You who have always been have learnt only cruelty. You who have always been have... You are trying to speak, Agara? I... I cannot hear you. Is it difficult for you to speak? Hmm? Do you feel invisible hands about your throat, do you? Squeezing the very life out of you? I will release you, so we may hear once more, so we may hear you beg for your freedom. You see us as less than human. How can you imagine you are better than me? How can you... Gara, that is enough. It hurts, does it not? Hmm? It hurts. But you will pray for this pain, Agara. When I hand you over to the tormentors in the cave of torture, you will pray that the pain around your neck killed you, and not the night of suffering that you and your kinsmen have ahead. A thousand times more painful than the invisible hands around your throat now. Take them from my sight. Take them to the tormentors. If any of them are still alive, I don't kill them then. <laughs> Mr. Ollie, do something! May I speak? Don't waste your pity or your reason. If I did not do this, you and your friends would never be safe here. They obey me through fear. Weakness breeds rebellion. Tell me, Holly. What good leaders does your great country remember? Did they not all rule through fear? You can rule nothing through gentleness. And she stood up and left. I wanted to talk to her about Leo. I wanted to beg her to help him, but I could not clear my thoughts. Her beauty crushed me. She's evil, then. What? Evil. That's what that was, wasn't it? That poor man. Oh, look at you. She's evil, Mr. Holly. Pure evil. Can't you see it? Uh, Sh shall I take you back to your cave? You, you could do with a good night's sleep, though I don't think much of their stone beds. You, you think they could manage a few pillows if they can strangle people from five feet away? Evil, that is. I couldn't sleep. I tossed and turned, the day's events turning over and over in my head burning and burning into me. I could bear it no more. I got up, took a lantern and began to explore. Outside there was a long passage. I heard a noise, panicked, and the lantern fell from my hands. It went out and I was plunged into pitch black. I stumbled in the filthy darkness and saw a tiny light ahead. Two walls pressed in on me as I crawled towards it, then there were steps that took me down and down. Girly, 
and from the room below, I could hear a woman crying. I stopped. I could see into the room now, the light flickering against its ancient walls. I tucked myself back against the wall and watched. Aisha, the reason I couldn't sleep. I had wanted to see her, could not bear even a night without looking upon her. She was stroking the head of one of the mummified corpses and whispering to it. Her beautiful face changed as she talked and a desolation flinched across it. Utter desolation, this colossal woman and yet so vulnerable in that moment, so lost. A cold gust of air moved across the room. Then her veil fell away from her and her garment slipped and I saw her form. It glistened, it rippled with transfixing perfection, her black hair falling down her neck, her whiteness iridescent, shimmering with thrilling beauty. I would have stumbled, fallen again, but I was gripped by fear as much as love, for her beauty was utterly terrifying. She bent down to kiss the dead body and then stood over it, beckoning to it to come to her and it moved. She made it move, this dead thing. It rose up towards her. I saw it move. And then still more terrifying was the face of the corpse. That dead body, the dead, reminded me of, of, but it couldn't be. Suddenly she let the body drop and I heard her say, for what use is the body without its spirit? I moved back into the darkness. I left her crying over that dead man, that corpse, hundreds and hundreds of years old. He's dead. He can't be. But Ali, is this true? I tell you, he's dead. I can see no movement, no life in him. I say he's dead, Job. No. Not Master Leo. I will go and tell she. Come, come now, both of you, come. We ran to Leo's side, but as we approached, we could hear someone scream and then cry out, an unearthly, desperate howl, not human. <laughs> It was Aisha. She was bending over Leo's form, crying. Why didn't you tell me? Tell you what? Why didn't you? I don't know what you mean. You must have known. Known what? I could kill you. I could kill you with one look. I, I don't know what I've done. Aisha, please, I don't know what I've done. To have come so close and to lose him again. Hold him up. Hold him up. Quickly do as I say. Hold him. I swear I will strike you dead as you stand. I'll hold him, I'll hold him. This may not save him now. Do not touch it. It can kill as easily as it can cure. The liquid must only touch his lips, only his lips. It is a sudden and dreadful cure. If there be one fragile spark of life within him still, we may yet save him. Leave us. Leave us. I will not go. He is mine. Who is yours? I have taken him as my husband. Go. I have taken him as my husband. Go, or you will die. He is my... I, 
I can't breathe. She can't breathe. I... He is not yours. Go now. Yes, my queen. Job, take her stomach. Mr. Holly, his lips are moving, his eyelids. Thank the heavens. Leave us. Go, Job. Yes, Mr. Holly. Oh, Carly Gratis. Carly Gratis. He... Oh. Will he live? Yes. My Carly Gratis will live. This is Leo, Aisha. This is my ward, Leo. No, it is Gallicrates. I've known him virtually all his life, since he was five. This is Leo Vinci, the son of my dear friend. No, you unbeliever, you know nothing. This is Gallicrates. Come back to me across time. It's Leo. That woman that was here, what is she to him? They're greatly fond of each other. Greatly? Do they love? Perhaps. They are married, I think, in the Amahaga way. He will awake in an hour. He will be fully well. Bring him to me then. I will see to the woman. What are you going to do to her? She saved him from the Amahaga. Look after him. I will be back. Are you going to hurt her? But she's done nothing wrong. Bring him to me when he wakes. I shuddered, shuddered for Astani and for me. Leo, the way she looked at Leo. She loved him. I was certain of it. She loved him, not me. I sat on the floor, crumpling my Norfolk jacket as I did so, and buried my head in my hands. And my little baboon heart broke. Slowly, color returned to Leo's face, my son and now my rival. The morning came, he awoke finally after so many days and asked for something to eat. My joy at seeing him alive helped me to forget for a moment all the dreadful things I had been privy to. I did not know how to begin to tell him of the things I had seen, and I stood over him, afraid for him. Can't be as bad as all that, old chap. Where's Ustani? I couldn't tell him. Don't sit up so quickly, Leo. You've oh. been terribly ill. Where's Astani? She went... Leo! Oh, oh, Master Leo! You both look at me as if I've come back from the dead. Where's Astani, Job? She... She... Is she the White Queen? Is she the one in Aminata's scroll? Have you seen her? Is she here? Yes. She's here. Oh, Holly. What does she look like? I will take you to her. Is she the same queen? What's her voice like, Holly? Is it like silk? Was I right to make us come all this way? You can decide when you meet her, Leo. Will she know what has happened to Astani? Yes, she'll know. She'll know, all right. I helped Leo up, but he needed little of my aid, such was the strength of Aisha's potion. And, in great apprehension, we went to see... she. It's good that you come so quickly. You look much better, my friend. Are you well enough to walk a little? I have something to show you. Holly tells me you saved my life. Yes. Thank you. Think nothing of it. I am only happy that I could help you. And I saw him standing next to her. And they looked like perfection standing next to perfection. Careful as you walk. Do you know where the woman I was with has gone? 
Ustani. She has returned to her tribe. Oh. This way. She has gone? Yes, she has gone. Truly? These savage women are fickle. They care about you one moment and then it is the usual way. We must travel downwards. We had an understanding. I, I thought we... I thought we cared for each other. We must travel downwards to a chamber. It is a chamber close to my heart. A candle is always lit there and has been lit for over 2,000 years while I wait. 2,000? Be careful where you tread. The steps to this place have been worn away through time and through my visits to your place of death. My place. Follow me. What are those mummified corpses? The dead. They're the ancient inhabitants of the city of Kor. These are their burial grounds. These catacombs go on forever. Here is the chamber. The man within is not from the city of Kor. Enter. Please, both of you, enter. Here he is. Here he has lain for over 2,000 years. Lift the veil. Lift the cloth from his face. Lift it. Lift it? Yes. Lift the cloth from his face. And it was as I feared, as I had seen the night before when I watched her crying in this tomb. My God. Holly. Oh, my God. Yes. Holly, look at it. Look at it. It is a likeness, certainly. Yes, of course. Just a likeness. Just a likeness. No, it's you. But how? It is you, Callicrates. Callicrates, my ancestor. You've come back. No, no. How can that dead body there, lying there, be me? I don't believe it. I can't believe it. Your spirit has been wandering across time, and now you are sent back, sent back to me. I am your Aisha. Aisha? Yes, your Aisha. I have waited for you for so long. How did you find me? It was a casket in the casket. My ancestors, they came again and again. They failed. There was a scroll. Amenartas. Amenartas. My enemy sent you back. Yes. Here. I must show you this. This is the cut by which I took your life. Every day, every moment, for more than 2,000 years, I have looked on your dead body and suffered for my loss. And only the one hope of your return has kept me. I can't believe this is me. I can't believe what you're saying to me. I won't believe it. How can you still be living? Life exists. Why, therefore, should not the means of preserving it forever also exist? And what sort of being are you if you have lived so long? Will you look upon me? No. Callicrates, will you look upon me? I am not Callicrates. Slowly, Aisha started to unwind the veil that covered her beautiful face. Look upon me. And I wanted to pull Leo to my side and bury his face in my arms because I knew that once he looked on her, once he had seen her, then he would be lost, as I am lost. You are crying, Callicrates. I could 
forgive you anything. Look at the two of you. Two what, Job? I'm just grateful I've never seen your 2,000-year-old girlfriend's face, if that's the effect it has. Do be quiet, Job. Makes you really tetchy, too, dating evil. Holly, can you make Job shut up? Yes, Job. Makes both of you tetchy. Fancy coming all this way, giving up our nice comfortable rooms, all that good upholstery and soft furnishings, so you can sit like two lovesick youngsters in a stinking cave surrounded by a swamp. Please, Job. Don't mind me. She awaits you. What's that? She awaits us. Where does she await us? Where does she want us to go, Bilali? To the Great Hall of the Ancient Ones for the Feast of the Full Moon. She's in the Great Hall of the Ancient Ones, Job. For a feast. Oh, for a buttered scone and a good armchair. We entered a vast, dimly lit cave. I could barely see its full height. Aisha nodded to Bilali, and suddenly, 20 Yamahaga ran into the space, carrying beacons blazing with white and purple flame. Then they were tossed into the air and thrown onto a pyre in the center of the hall. And as the flames burnt, to my horror, I saw the peeling away of fabric, then of flesh, and then the bone and the skeleton beneath. They were burning the mummified corpses of the inhabitants of Kor. Fifty, sixty, a hundred of them carried running across the room and thrown onto the ever-mounting pyre. They make a good light, do they not? They're burning corpses. They are dead, Joe. They're corpses, Mr. Roy. You don't even respect the dead. You can only see the Great Hall fully when lit like this. Only then can you observe the intricate work on its walls. Figures from the ancient, grand world of Kor. The past. Fully illuminated. Leo! Leo! Bustani, let her go, Aisha, let her go. Leo! Why have you tied her? What harm has she done? Leo! Lali, give me your knife. This is for you, Callicrates. Take the knife. Hold it against my neck. One gentle slice and you will kill me. What are you doing? Hold it to my neck. Do it. As you wish. Kill me, or Ustani will die. What? Kill me and you save her. No, you must let her go. If you do not kill me, she will die. You must choose one of us. There cannot be two. Leo! She will kill you, Leo. Let me die, not you. Leo looked back towards Ustani and then back towards Aisha. And it broke him. I watched him crumble. He let go of the knife and it dropped to the floor. I curse you. I curse you, she who must be obeyed. My spirit will follow you. My spirit will... And a white streak spread across Ustani's soft, dark hair. And she fell down, dead. The Amahaga simply picked her up and tossed her onto the fire. Her dead eyes never leaving Leo's. He looked away, held his head in his hands, and looked down at Aisha's feet. Crushed. She took his hand, helped him to his feet, and then led Leo away. You are angry with me. You wish me dead? No. Here. Here's the knife again. I am defenseless against you. Here is my neck. Calligrates cut my white neck. You only did what you thought was... Ustani. She, she was... Uh, Calligrates. And I, I can see you thought... She stood in your, in your way... I... Let me take the veil from my face. Let me unwind the cloth that clings to my form. There, Callicrates. 
You have seen all of me. Tell me if you are angry now. How can I be? How could any man be angry with you? I long for each part of you. To touch each soft moment, to wrap myself around you, to hold you, take you. The longing for you is unbearable. You are everything. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because I am happy. And I have not been happy for 2,000 years. And now I am let me hold here. No, not yet. There is something you must do first. For if we were to unite now, my shattering beauty would burn you, destroy you with its brilliance. No. Your longing must wait. Wait two more nights, my Calicrates. Only two more. And then our union will bring the world to heal, and our might will rule over all things. <coughs> Holly. <laughs> Dear Holly, come in. Come in. I am to return with you. What? To Great Britain. You are? Of course. Where Callicrates and I will be king and queen. We will rule, oh, shall we not, Callicrates? We shall rule your small country with our united greatness. Uh, we, uh, we have a queen. We have a queen already. No matter. You'll have a new one. No, uh, we have a democracy. Yes. Uh, the people, they decide who governs. There's a government and, and, and laws. The people... What do the people know? The people are always ignorant. How can they choose? It's their right. We will sweep away the old. Is that not right, Callicrates? And take all that can and should be ours. You are the most marvellous creature, Aisha. Uh -huh. Nothing is beyond you. You're going to go back to England and dethrone Queen Victoria and then the government? Leo! How would you have her live? How could she live under another's authority when she is all-powerful and all-knowing? She can't just arrive and then take over England, Britain? Good God, the Empire! She can do whatever she wants. Who will stop her? Such utter beauty, such complete perfection can't be wrong, can it, Ollie? How can anyone so lovely be wrong? Oh, I uh. must prepare for tomorrow. I am so happy. Holly, you must come with us too. Where are we going? To the pillar of life, so Callicrates and I may be together. Callicrates, sleep in the chamber next to mine tonight, so I may hear you breathing as you sleep, as I will for centuries and centuries to come. There's no respect for the dead, even. Where are we going? To the Pillar of Life. What's that when it's at home? It's somewhere she needs to take us to. I thought we were packing to go back to England. No, Job, not yet. We should leave now. We should go home. Leave? Yeah. Before anything else evil happens. I'm not leaving. We're going with her tomorrow, Job. <sighs> Yesterday she killed Ustani. We watched her die. Look at you both. You're so carried away with this bloodthirsty woman you can't see what's happening. And she's changing you. Yesterday, she killed Ustani in front of us. And we did nothing to stop it. How could we have stopped it? We could have tried. There's no respect for anything here. They set fire to corpses. There were over a hundred Amahaga, Job. Maybe more, all armed. Tell me how we could have stopped them. And you still love her. You still care for that monster. Just pack. You've never talked to me like that before. Never. Please, Job, we're going with her tomorrow. And you, Mr. Ollie, you're no better. Uh, Job, I don't think it's any of your business how I feel. Is it not? When I watch both of you turn mean and uncaring, when, when you ignore a dying girl? There was nothing we could do. Aisha is too powerful. How could you not love her? <sighs> Look at you both. We have to leave. 
something dreadful's gonna happen if we stay and and these people here she's she's made them that way isn't she cruelness breeds cruelness they can throw one of their own kind on a fire that's what she's done to these people she's turned the hearts of these men into the monster that she is imagine what she can do to you and, and did you see how she choked you stanny do, do you see it dark hearts isn't it the work of the devil job you and your Darwin and your Herbert bloody Spencer. The devil still exists, you know. Look, she's living proof. How can someone with such great knowledge from centuries and centuries of living be evil? No matter how long you live, if your heart's as black as they come, what difference will one more day make? Knowledge civilizes, Job. No, that'll be compassion. Knowledge just means you know more. Doesn't mean you feel more, does it? Don't you know nothing, Mr. Ollie? Deepest respect, sir. And, and last night... Yes, Joe? My old dad came to me. Long since dead, my old dad. And he, and he said, What sort of place is this? I never thought to find you in such a place so far from home. I'll be seeing you proper soon, Joe. I'll be coming to collect you, son. What a dump this place is, he said. And then he left. I think my time's nearly over, Mr. Holly. That's what he came to tell me. My, my time's over. It's a dream, Job. No. It's not just a dream, Mr. Ollie. I never expected to see Cambridge again when we left her. You'll be on your own soon, my good friends. You must take care of yourselves when I'm gone and get yourselves home. Don't say such things, Job. Nothing is certain. Nothing is ever certain. Some things are, Master Leo. You're such a good man. Don't let her turn you into something different. There, the packing's done. I'll be off then, to lie down on my stone bed. Good night, gentlemen. Good night, dear good friend. Good night, Joe. In the morning, five litters were waiting for us in the sharp light, and we began our journey. The air was cool with a slight breeze, but as the day grew on, the breeze dropped into stillness. The grass faded and the territory grew rocky and arid. By late afternoon, a city came into view. Bill Ali and our carriers set us down at its gates. Here we will sleep. The ancient city of Kor. Look at this joke. What? It's extraordinary. It's like they never end. The African setting sun made the ruins appear golden. Mile upon mile of columns, the palaces of dead kings, timeless and silent. The sheer immensity of this lost civilization took our breath away. Aisha guided us into what must have been a temple. The light started to fade and a large full moon rose. And it was as if the ruins regained their former grandeur in that gentle blue light. And the city's inhabitants moved through it once more. They say it's haunted, the Amahagar. They won't come in here. They leave the city to its dead. Come, there is something still more fascinating. Here, mind how you step, you two. There's some awfully wobbly stones here. And we followed her covered white form, moving like a spirit in the silver light, through to an inner shrine inside the temple. There. Is she not breathtaking to behold? He's a son. Who is she? On a ball of jet black marble, some 30 to 50 feet across, stood a pure white-winged figure, maybe a hundred feet high, and of exquisite workmanship. Her body was caressed in curves and folds, suggesting a fabric, perhaps linen, that covered the whole of her form. She was utterly beautiful to behold, with an expression of serenity and yet desolation. Who is she, Aisha? She is truth, the goddess of truth. Look. 
She holds her hands out towards you and weeps, for she is eternally alone. The people of Kor worshipped her. What happened to them? A plague. A black death came in the air from the swamplands. They died one by one. And then the ancestors of the Amahagar, they overran the city, sacked it, pillaged it, and left the place to die. Come, I am tired. Let us eat and sleep. They dress the same then. Are you sure in that thing? You mean the goddess of truth, oh, Joe? Is that what it is? Aisha's covered from head to toe in the same way, though, isn't she? God help us if truth is as evil as she is. Take that back, Job. No. Take it back or I will be forced to fight with you. You are? He loves her, Job. Take it back or I will be forced to fight you. I won't, Master Leo. Fists up. Don't be silly. Oh, come on, you Fists two. up. Uh, Job, Leo. All right. You'll regret this, Leo. Uh, Take that. I can uh, still teach you a thing or two. Oh, really? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because... You fight for my honour. No. As if the words of your fat servant could matter. That's why I laugh. Why is she laughing? I keep fighting. Don't stop. I keep fighting. I'm not finished with you yet. I keep fighting. Why is she laughing? Because you both look ridiculous. No. That's not why. I'm not a fool. Damn you, Leo. Damn you. Damn both of you in this stinking, dreadful place. <laughs> Oh, he is angry, your fat servant. Yes, he's angry. Shall I kill him for you? No, please don't. No, Aisha. There's no need to kill him. Well, I can if you wish me to. He seems a troublesome servant. In the morning, we left the city and found Bilali and his men waiting for us next to the gates. Very quickly, the air grew hot as we were carried through this barren landscape. A great mountain loomed in front of us. We came to within 300 yards of this fierce angular rock and stopped. Bilali, you and your people must turn away from us. Make camp here, but on pain of death, do not watch us as we enter the mountain. We're going to climb that. Bilali, give the plank to their fat servant. Here, take. What's this? It's a plank. Joe. I can see what it is. What's it for? Follow me. Is your fat servant angry again? Would you like me to kill him now? <laughs> What's she saying? She asked us if we'd like her to kill you. Leo! I'll stay with you if it's all the same, Mr. Ollie. You might need me, yeah? And so we started our ascent up the steep wall, virtually perpendicular. Come. Come. This way. Aisha went first. <sighs> Quickly, we followed her up and found ourselves inside the opening in the mountainside. Light the lanterns and follow me. And so we climbed down deep into the mountain. Then we came to a small ledge, and as we looked below, we could see no end to its darkness. Great gusts of wind rose and fell in its never-ending gloom. A great abyss that dropped to the bottom of the earth. And Aisha walked ahead of us, casually, as if she could walk on air. On and on we went. And then we came to where the ledge ended. Pass me the plank. We're going to cross that. Give Aisha the plank, Joe. We'll never get across that. Whatever is that sound? Here. Come. I will go first. It's strong. Now, you, Calligrates, don't look down. Just look into my eyes and walk. That's it. Slowly. Carefully, one foot in front of the other. Look at me, not down. That's it. Holly, 
I regard myself as a man with strong nerves, but even I faltered at this crossing. Right foot, left foot. I can't move. Don't look down, old fellow. Look at me. Right foot. Left foot. And I was over. That left Job, who was on his knees praying. Her father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Job. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Job. And deliver us from evil. Job. Who is he praying to? For thine is the kingdom. There are no gods here. Can he see a god? Job. Forever and ever. Amen. Get on the plank, Job. I don't think I can stop myself from looking down, Mr. Ollie. It wobbles so. It wobbles. It's not secure. It's not... Jump, Job! The rock it was resting on gave way. Job leapt into the air, and it was Leo whose strong arm seized it. But the plank spun down into the great chasm, spinning in the darkness, until finally we heard it land in its deep base. Aisha spat, cursed Job. But Leo had saved his life, and some peace had been made between them. We went on. Here is the chamber. The pillar of life passes through here. Callicrates, I dreamt last night dreams of darkness and death. It was as if I was watched, and each step marked in time. If something was to happen to me, if I was to die, Alicrates, if I was to sleep whilst you were left waking, would you wait for me, as I have waited for you? Would you choose never to forget me, so that when you find me again, when I am born again as you were, you will remember? You would remember me? <sighs> the flame of life. I brought you here before. I begged you to stand in this flame once before. I stood in the fire waiting for you. But you... You turned away and clung to your Amenartas. And I was filled with rage and I killed you. I took a knife from your side and I plunged it into your heart. And we two women stood over you. She knew I had become immortal. She knew then that I would live forever. And she cursed me. I curse you. I curse you, Aisha. You will never know peace or happiness. You will grow weary, alone, and desolate. Never doubt that my revenge, as my hate, will be eternal. There. I have told you everything. And Leo moved the veil from her face and kissed her. I love you, Aisha, with the whole of my being. And I will never leave you. Never. Then come with me. Come with me into the immortal flame. I took a sideways glance at Job. I was aware that he had never seen Aisha's face before. And it was as I feared, his mouth had dropped open, and I wasn't sure if he wasn't dribbling. We must both undress, for the flame will burn our clothes. Job? Job? Maybe we should look away. Away? Yes. Away. 
Of course, Mr. Ali. Aisha. I'm afraid. Don't be. I will go in first. And then you must come to me, my love. I must confess, neither Job nor myself could turn our heads away. Who could? And I would give everything, everything, to see that woman stand in those flames again. A rainbow flame it was, caressing her form, sweeping up and down and swooping into her mouth, glowing with the same utter brilliance. My head, my, I feel all my strength. Aisha. Aisha, she's curling up. Aisha! What is happening to me? Calligrathis! What is happening? Oh, my arms! Hold me, Calligrathis! Hold me! Don't go in. She's curling up. Like a monkey. My arms! My skin! Hold me! Hold me! She's aging, Leah. I'm old! My skin! Old! Caligradis! Old! Aisha! Tell me she's not dead. How can she die? I should stand in the flame. Leo. How will I remember her when she returns? I must. No, you don't. But she'll be lost from me forever if I don't. I won't let you stand in the flame. You'll go rotten, Master Leo. <sighs> then, then I'm parted from her forever. No, Leo. You will find her again. But I won't know her. Come, my dear chap, we must still leave this dreadful place. But how will I know her? Please, Leo, please, we must leave. I will find her again. Won't I, Holly? Come on, Leo. Let's go. The climb back was slow. But the cold and terror of that place urged us quickly on until we reached the chasm where the plank had gone. We'll have to jump. Can you jump it? It's all we can do. I'll go first. And I ran and hurled myself across that chasm, landing sharply on the wobbly stone that had held the weight of the plank. Well done, Mr. Ollie. Well jumped. Now you, Job. Yes, Master Leo. Yes. Job crossed himself, took a running jump, and hurled himself across the abyss, landing two inches from the edge. I embraced him. And now me. And Leo. And he fell short, clinging beneath the wobbling stone. I am going to fall! Take my hand, Master Leo, take my hand! And Job leant across the stone, and we pulled Leo up, slowly. On safe ground now, Master Leo. There, my friend. Joe, get off! Get off the rock! Oh, oh. And there was a sudden gush of wind, and the rock with Job on it fell and fell. Job, our good friend Job, down into the bottom of that great chasm. Our good friend Job. Where is she? She is dead, Bilali. She cannot die. Where is the fat one? Dead too. You must escape from here if she is truly dead. Tell no one. My people are still angry with you for Toman's death. 
You must go quickly, my baboon. Here now. You must take your robe as my gift. My people wove this. It is a beautiful thing from our people. Ustani had some hand in this. I'll take it, Holly, so it will always remind us. Well, I have nothing to give you, Bilali. What about your Norfolk jacket? Oh, yes, yes, my jacket. Uh, Bilali, would you like my jacket? It would be an honor for me if you accept one of my prized possessions. Oh. <sighs> Thank you, my baboon. It will make me laugh when the nights are too long. And I will think of you and your hairy face. <laughs> It is sad that your people know so little about cloth. Such a dull color. But we must leave. I will show you the way to the great river, which will take you to the sea. And through further hardships and trials, and with the help of Bilali, we returned home. Our lodgings were silent and strange without Job. Never had Leo felt more like my son and I his father. We remained inseparable. And as we grew old together, my mind fell to going over the past again and again. And Aisha. Was it power that had corrupted her so completely? And can such power only ruin us? Or perhaps it was something quite different that had made her so cruel towards the Amahaga. Was it the longing, the endless longing, as each year, decade, century went by for him as she waited for Callicrates, for Leo? And it was that waiting and its bitter solitude and its aching loneliness that had destroyed all notions of right and wrong. And as lines appeared on Leo's handsome face and his hair thinned, I thought I caught a glimpse of that same desolation creep across his mind. An endless regret. An endless longing for she. She, by Ryder Haggard, was dramatised for radio by Hattie Naylor. Aisha was played by Mia Soteriu, Holly by Tim McInerney, Leo by Oliver Chris, and Job by Howard Coggins. Janice Aqua was Ustane and Amanatus, Benon Wukwe was Bilali, and Damian Lynch was Agara. Specially composed music was by Elizabeth Purnell. She was directed in Bristol by Sarah Davis. Well, that's that. 